Hey folks, today I've got your full in-depth review of the new Wahoo Roam V2 or 2022 or just the new Roam, whatever you want to call it. Now, this will be a relatively short review because there's not a lot of new on it. And as such, I'm basically going to divide up the review into kind of three basic chunks. Uh, the first chunk is what's new, both the hardware and the software. The second chunk is a very brief like user interface tour, explainer, just how it works out in the road, all that kind of goodness. And then the final chunk is looking at the accuracy because that does dive into one of the new features. So with that, I'll just go straight into it into the first chunk, which is the newness and starting off with the hardware side of things. The biggest one, though, is the new multiband or dual frequency GPS. And now technically this is GNSS. Now at a very high level the way this works is basically there's more satellites you can connect to uh, and there are different frequencies and so ideally it works better in harder GPS environments. Things like cities for example, buildings, but also mountains, mountain biking, all that kind of goodness. Now there is no GPS configuration option, just always on by default and I'll dive into whether or not that makes a difference later on in the video. The next new item is more colors, uh, up to 64 colors from the original 16 they had previously. Uh, practically speaking you probably won't notice that a lot uh, in this display. There's a few things here and there where the shading is just a bit nicer, for example, uh, but I think we'll see it more with one of the new software features we'll talk about in just a second. The next item is increased storage. There's now 32 gigs of storage on there versus the previous four gigs of storage on the original Roam, uh, and that's basically just used for maps. And with that, they're able to preload way more maps, like almost the entire world. Though, oddly, I still had to download the Netherlands here, about 300 megs or so. Not too big a deal. Uh, at the end of the day, I've only got 828 megs, so just under one gig of that 32 gigs left over. But again, the idea is that almost all of the world is already preloaded, or at least the most popular places to cycle on this unit. You can download additional maps for free. It takes just a few seconds to do via Wi-Fi. Pretty quick and easy. Okay, and a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting or useful, just whack that like button the bottom down there. It really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Three more quick changes. Uh, number one is that they've made the buttons like uppies, if that makes sense. It used to be innies. If, I don't know how that makes sense. But basically, the buttons pop up on the very top here versus being inset. So like they're not like a bowl anymore. Uh, makes it easier for gloves. Uh, number two is this is now USB-C charging and transfer if you need to on the bottom right there. So you can see that. USB-C port, same as the Wahoo Bolt uh, V2 was. And then number three is they maintained the 17-hour battery life claims. Uh, one last bit of notables is that the price has increased from 379 US dollars to 399 US dollars. Welcome to 2022 and all the things around that. Now, in terms of software features, I'm dividing those into two camps. Uh, the first camp is things that are coming not just to this unit, but also to other units as well. Uh, the first one is that as of yesterday, Wahoo system workouts, so that's the structure workouts can now be sent to Wahoo Element devices in the same way that you would have done for Trainer Road or Training Peaks or I think uh, let's see Today's Plan, other companies like that. Uh, absolutely no different whatsoever. I tried to get that working and it didn't work for me. So I ended up just using Trainer Road on my ride today, but uh, I'm sure there's some like minor backend issue that's preventing that, but that's across all of the Wahoo Element devices. In any case, the next item on the list again across all devices or most devices anyways from Wahoo uh, is the ability to do cloud-based backups and restores. So so very similar to like your phone, you can back it up to the cloud and then restore it again in case something goes wrong. You can't actually manually do a backup. You can manually do a restore, but the backups happen every single time you go out for a ride uh, or if you unpair it. The next item beyond that is a Super Sapiens integration. Uh, so if you have a Super Sapiens sensor, uh, that'll go ahead and now integrate directly to this. But directly is all relative. It goes directly via your phone or via the Super Sapiens band that you can wear. Uh, and that's due to like regulatory stuff with them and Abbott Labs. So uh, that's not something that you can go straight from the Wahoo head unit uh, to the sensor on your arm, uh, the exact same way that it works with Garmin and other integrations. So just keep that in mind. And then we get to two features that are brand new on the Roam V2, but they're not here today. So, uh, and I have virtually no information except a single screenshot on these. Uh, so the first one is the ability to do what Wahoo's calling summit segments. So it sounds a lot like Climb Pro, uh, and that's coming again sometime soonest. They're saying a few weeks, but again, Wahoo's track record on software updates tends to be like more measured in the months and years when it comes to these new features that are promised at launch. So in any case, summit segments will show you the uh, gradient for the upcoming climb. It'll show you the distance to the top. Again, very much like Garmin Climb Pro or uh, Hammerhead's Climber features. Uh, and again, it's something that they've got a whole criteria of what constitutes a climb in terms of distance and gradient uh, and all that. But I don't have, I've not tested it in any way, shape, or form. I just got this screenshot right there of what that looks like. So again, looking forward to seeing that down the road. And then the second feature is what's called public route sharing. Uh, and that idea is that basically, if you have other Wahoo users around you and you have the app loaded and you have your Wahoo uh, 
unit, by computer, or whatever, you can go ahead and share those routes based on your geolocation. So it looks at other people with the app that are open and going, hey, maybe you wanna share this route, et cetera. Idea being like if you're at a coffee shop before a ride, you can quickly share routes. That feature I've not seen at all, not even like a screenshot of how that works. Uh, so I'm not really sure when that'll come either. Um, in any case, let's just quickly look at the unit, uh, what's in the box, by the way. So here is the box, that's way too close, sorry. Uh, but we'll just crack this open. I've already got it unboxed, of course. Uh, so let me just show you the mount that's included. So you've got an out front mount, which is a nice touch to include that. Uh, and you've got a you know standard kind of like a quarter turn, I guess the half turn mount, if you will. Uh, and this you can use with the zip ties on there. Uh, and then it does include this USB-C cable. So nothing super fancy there. Uh, again, pretty standard for most bike computers out there. So that's what's in the box. So once you got your box, all unboxed, then you've got the unit right here and you're gonna have your companion app. So this is the Wahoo Element app. And this allows you to configure most of the settings on the Wahoo Element computers, Roam, Rival, et cetera. Uh, you can see at the top, you've got the ability to customize data pages. You can create your own data pages here. Uh, I can add a custom page. I can change this one right there. Add up to 11 fields in it. And you're gonna order these fields from most important to least important because this allows you later on in the ride, if I just go back here to the ride pages, choose a normal data page, I'm pressing the page button right there. That's my location, uh, there we go. Uh, I want a different one, this one right here. This has 11 different fields on it. I can increase or decrease these fields uh, to the most important fields. So kind of zooming in and out. This has been like a marquee Wahoo feature since the very beginning. A lot of people love it. The downside though is there's no way to make specialized uh, data pages or sets of data pages for mountain biking versus road riding, etc. You basically just got one user profile to work with. If we go back to the main page here, uh, you'll see I have LEDs and sound. That's because on the left-hand side right here and on the top side, there are these LEDs these color IDs, and they can customize to power, speed, or heart rate, uh, as well as different notifications. Uh, you can see the top LEDs there and the sounds uh, based on things like Strava segments, etc. Again, one of the kind of the marquee features of the Wahoo Element series. Uh, and this is nice, but I've also found it a bit quirky. Like today on my ride at a customized workout, uh, and it was showing me the colors on the screen itself. So you can see right here some of those uh, different zones and whatnot. But those are my power zones, not the actual targets for the workout. So even though it was showing me green, Green, they weren't actually the correct colors for being in zone uh, for that particular segment of the workout. So again, it's appreciated, but not always like super well thought through. Below that, you got things like backlight, auto shutdown, you can pair up sensors. Uh, in my case here, I have a handful of different sensors paired up. So if I go on down, uh, you can pair sensors on both the bike computer as well as on the app. So you can see I've got a heart rate sensor, I've got Shimano DA2, I've got Rally, I've got the Shimano Power Meter. I can add sensors right there, uh, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, they do support the vast majority of sensors that you might wanna add, both AMP Plus and Bluetooth Smart. Uh, and I've got a list right here on the side so you can see all those. Uh, and there's also ones that are supported kind of via these quirky little custom implementations. For example, core body temperature sensors, you can pair to this as other sensor types and pull that data in. And then back on the app here, uh, you can see I can go down and I can enable live tracks that'll automatically send out a link to my friends and family when I'm riding. Uh, I can manage maps so I can add uh, additional additional maps if I want to, uh, or download or update maps, I can do that from the uh, app here. And then going down further, there's auto lap and auto pause segment. There's the ability to go ahead and enable or disable Strava Live segments. Uh, and you can see out in the ride, if I put some screenshots of that right here, uh, as I approach a segment, it'll go ahead and say, hey, there's a segment coming up. It'll then give me a go. And then as I'm moving along that segment, I can change whether or not my target to be uh, myself, my PRs, for example, or the KOM. Uh, and it'll show me how far or behind I am on that particular segment. If I have multiple overlapping segments, I can press the little uh, segment button on the bottom left-hand corner and then change which segment I wanna look at. Uh, and then down below that, I have alerts. I can enable uh, text alerts or disable text alerts. They'll show up on the screen and if I miss them, uh, for example, I missed this really important one here from uh, GP Llama at the top. So I can always go back into the menu and I can see that up there uh, and I can go ahead and see more information about it. Uh, and it obviously looks pretty, pretty critical there, pretty mission critical in my ride. Uh, so it's unfortunate that I missed this midway through, but I am happy that I can always go back and refer to it here in the menus if I need to. So in terms of out in the ride when it comes to things like navigation, uh, if I go back here, I press page, page again, and then right here, I've got this little dot, dot, dot. That's where I can choose a route as well as pan and zoom. So I can tap this and I can retrace an existing ride. So a ride I may want to redo again. I can route back to the start if I'm in the middle of something. I can take me to, this will select one of my pre-saved waypoints um, or it allows me to choose a point on the map. I can't type an address in here. I have to do that on the smartphone app if I wanted to, but I can do that. I can say, go to Central Station or go to some town far away and then it'll route me to that just fine. Um, or down at the bottom, I can choose the different routes that I have, my different platforms. So these are Strava routes, there's some 
moot routes in there and so on. If I go far enough down here, these are all routes that I've linked with the element app uh, and then churn that links it with the element devices. I can select this particular route. It'll load that route. Uh, sometimes this seems to take a little bit of time as you can see right there. Once out riding, if I'm on the map page, you'll see the chevrons on the route. That's basically where I need to follow. Uh, and then I can see the very top, the distance to my next queue. Um, also, as I approach a different churn or you know, basically some sort of directional queue, it'll give me uh, a pop-up on whatever page I'm on. So I don't have to be on the map page at all times to see that. And then if I miss a turn, for example, or go off course for somehow, uh, then it'll go ahead and give me rerouting instructions to get back on course because it does have uh, that map set, that full data map set on the unit. So it's not requiring my phone to do any of that. I didn't have any issues with the routing at all during any of my rides. It worked just fine, uh, which is something that's improvement over the past. Uh, here in the Netherlands and Amsterdam in particular, it's got just an incredible density of bike paths and uh, bike routes. And sometimes it's caused issues with a lot of different companies' devices, but uh, overall pretty good job here from Wahoo on that. In terms of other data fields, again, no problems with any of those either. As you can see some of them here on the screen as I just kind of show you some quick pictures and videos of those. Uh, all those work just fine also. Now, one thing people always ask about, what about gradient responsiveness? And as I mentioned, I live in a place that is pancake flat. Like this table generally has more elevation gain, uh, like this tiny little crack than where I live here. Uh, and once the summit segments piece is implemented, I will go off and travel somewhere and find a hill. Uh, but until then, it's kind of tough to do that. So instead, I've got basically a bunch of highway overpasses uh, and other kind of very, very short little hills that are over overpasses. And a lot of people often compare on very short hills and say there's like lag and stuff like that. So I found the perfect little hill today on my ride. Uh, very, very short, kind of steep. A uh, good way to kind of demonstrate this. It up now. Zero, 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 zeros on the flats. Still zeros. And by the time I got to the top, none of the units had shown any gradient change at all. Uh, only once I got to the top of the hill and started going down the other side, did the Wahoo Roam and the Edge 830 show it, and a couple seconds later, the Edge 1040 showed it. So uh, again, sometimes you just have to wait a few seconds. And the purpose of having some sort of latency in most of the cases for most units is to reduce errors. Uh, versus if you're always reacting to every little thing, even the tiniest little like literal pothole in the road might trigger gradient response that isn't really what you want. So with that, let's quickly look at the GPS accuracy. Given the new multi-band uh, GPS configuration in this, uh, and I've got a couple different rides, in particular, a couple areas I wanna kind of demonstrate. Uh, on this at first ride here, I went out and like the first portion was farmlands and then eventually got into the city. And if I look at the farmlands, not to like spend too much time on this, it's perfect. The Hammerhead Crew, the uh, Garmin Edge 1040, and this and some of my watches were like spot on, like really, really good. It's very, very few issues out there. Not few, there were zero issues out there. Uh, the one exception though was back in the city. And this is where ideally, again, multi-band GPS is what's supposed to be kind of the savior here. Uh, and on this particular section, I use this on all of my GPS tests for the last year or so that have multi-band configurations uh, to usually demonstrate how good it is. And unfortunately, the Rome didn't do so good here. It did clearly worse than the Hammerhead Crew, which does not have multi-band GPS. Uh, I did worse on my phone, which did not have multi-band GPS. Uh, and you can see it just all over the place. But stay tuned a second on this one. Uh, so then I went out a couple days later, another kind of route that also had a lot of like highway overpasses and stuff. Uh, and the Rome and the Edge 1040, both with multi-band GPS, no problems at all. Like they were spot on on all this stuff. I mean, really, really good. But before I got to those sections, I actually went back to the city and did the exact same pass again. Uh, and in this case, the Rome V2 did fine. It did pretty much spot on with the Edge 1040, which also has multi-band GPS. Uh, so really good there. Uh, and then you can see where it's clearly outperforming the Edge 830 as well as the Fitbit uh, Sense 2, uh, neither of which have multi-band GPS. Uh, there's a couple other places like where you could, you know, kind of debate back and forth which unit was better or worse between this and the Edge 1040 from a GPS standpoint. But on this particular ride, it was essentially a wash. Okay, so at this point, where do we stand overall with the Wahoo Roam V2? And that's where it gets a little bit trickier. Uh, if we look at the price of this, it's 400 bucks, the same price as the Garmin Edge 830, the same price as the Hammerhead Crew 2, 100 bucks more than the Edge 530. This doesn't have a touchscreen like the Edge 830 does or the Hammerhead Crew does, and that's fine. I don't think you need a touchscreen for things. Uh, but more importantly, it just doesn't have the features. I mean, if we look at the new features that are supposed to be the marquee features on this unit today, they're not here today. And while we have promises from Wahoo, again, if I look historically at Wahoo's software-based promises over the last few years, just looking at this time frame, 
they're not good. They're, uh, I mean, the, the products end up being relatively good, but the actual promise dates uh, almost are never hit um, over the last few years. Uh, and I think that's tough, especially when the features they're adding are essentially just catch-up features. And, you know, I said when the Wahoo Roam came out a few years ago, i put a little quote somewhere on the screen right now, that I said it was concerned because I felt like in some ways Wahoo lost their mojo in terms of adding new features uh, and keeping up with, you know, Garmin and now Hammerhead, which have been adding lots and lots of features. And to be clear, it's not always about features. If we look back, you know, a few years ago, Wahoo's strength was that it didn't crash, it didn't have issues. Uh, but these days, you know, Garmin's done a ton of work in that arena, uh, and other companies like Hammerhead have as well. And I don't think that's really a differentiator for 99% of the population. Uh, is this easier to use than a Garmin? Maybe. Some people will say it is. Some people are like, it's all the same. It doesn't really matter. And I think this is where I'm not sure how competitive this unit is today, let alone if we fast forward to next spring, which is typically we do see new bike computers. And I think if we look at companies like Garmin, they're overdue from the Edge 530 and the 830. Hammerhead is overdue on the Karoo 2. And I'm not super sure why Wahoo would have rushed to release this today with unbaked features versus waiting till like next spring, uh, even using the same hardware and having a whole slate of new features then that could be kind of a bigger launch and ready to go and be more competitive perhaps with whatever we see uh, in that time frame. Uh, which is to say there's nothing wrong with this Rome. Like this works. I had no technical issues with this. I just worry it's not super competitive in today's landscape uh, and especially not going forward in that landscape either. Anyways, hopefully you found this video interesting and useful. If so, go ahead and like that like button at the bottom there or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. It's, it's going to be a busy week for sure. Have a good one.